and asked him, and over and over again you'll see that this is how Jesus describes God. Because when one man came to him and asked him, he said, Oh good master, tell me how do I go to heaven? Jesus didn't even answer his question. He asked him a question. He said, Why are you calling me good? For there is no one that is good except for one, and that is God. And all good emanates from him. Jesus immediately just disassociated himself from being called what only you should call God. Immediately he does that. He said, don't call me good because there's only one that's good and that's God. And he said also about God, he said, do, do good works before men so that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. He didn't say your Father who is standing right here. He also said that no man hath seen God at any time, nor hath any man heard his voice. No man has seen God at any time. Now there is another version where, who's, where in, the, in the New Testament where it's quoted as Jesus saying, those who have seen me have seen the Father. Now either they translated it wrong, either the understanding is wrong, or you have two contradictory statements. Because Jesus is saying you can't see God, and now you're trying to tell me that he said that if you see me, you've seen God. So there's a problem here. But I'm going with the stuff that, that is the majority. I'm not going with the little minority things that Christians like to pick out and divert people from seeing the reality of the issue. Also, when a man came to Jesus and asked him about salvation, justification, he came to him and said, oh good, he came to him and said, tell me, dear master, how do I inherit eternal life? A rich man came to Jesus and said, tell me how to go to heaven. Since you are who you say you are, then tell me how do I go to heaven? Now, I, now to me, if Jesus' whole life mission was to come and live on this earth for 33 years and to die on the cross for the salvation of the sins of humanity and that by believing in that blood sacrifice you could obtain salvation, here's the chance to say it. Because apparently there's people watching because someone wrote it down. What did Jesus say to the man? He said the way to go to, to, to heaven is to follow the law. Obey the commandments. Obey the commandments of God. Follow God's law. And this is how you can go to heaven. And the man said, I've done that. He said, well, if you've really done that, he, 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 he tried him at that point. If you've really done that, you're so rich, give up all your wealth and then come help me. Because if you are perfect according to the law, then you need to be, doing, you need to be helping me. The man walked away crying because he knew he was, not, he was not doing all he should be doing. And also I realized that Jesus, I'm going to be done in about 20 minutes. I also realized that Jesus was not sent to me through the teachings of the New Testament. Jesus was sent to the children of Israel alone. We believe in him as a Muslim. We believe in him, but he was not our prophet. He was the prophet of Bani Israel. He was not for us. We believe in him. But he was not for us. That's why when he returns, he will not return in the position of prophethood. He will not return in the position of a prophet. Because he was a prophet for a time and a place. And that time and place is past. Because Jesus himself even says in the New Testament that I was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's it. And this was the problem of the children of Israel. And I'm going to tell you, this is going to give you the whole summary of what Jesus was all about. Even from the New Testament. The children of Israel were very diverted. They had deviated far away from God at this point. And what was happening was that the Pharisees, there was a group known as the Pharisees, they were the scholars, they were the ulama of the Bani Israel, they were the, the, the key holders of the temple, they were the one who went in and did the sacrifices in the, in the temple in the holiest of holies, uh, they were the ones who did, collected all the money, uh, they were the ones who were probably the, they, they at that time were the most rich, the most powerful, the most astute amongst the children of Israel, but the biggest problem was that they were corrupt to the bone. And they were using God's law and God's religion to subjugate the people and keep the people ignorant, to keep the people poor and to make themselves richer and to make themselves more prominent and establish themselves as the leaders and the rulers and everyone else just had to do what they said and follow the way that they told them to follow it or else they were all going to hell, basically. Um, so they were using religion to subjugate the people. They were using finance to subjugate the people. They were using their, everything they could to keep the people ignorant and in poverty. And honestly, this is some of the same trickery that is being used to subjugate people all throughout the world and Muslims, the majority. The majority of us Muslims all throughout the world are being subjugated by these very, very same means. So this is what they were doing. And Jesus came to knock them off that pedestal, the Pharisees. He came to let them know that this is not the way it should be run. That's why 
one of Jesus' first incense, one of his first things when he entered into Jerusalem. Not, but he was not born in Jerusalem. He was born in Nazareth or Bethlehem. We don't know because the, 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 the Bible says two different things. Two different things. One says he was born in Bethlehem. One says he was born in Nazareth. But anyway, when he entered into Jerusalem, one of the first things he did, or last, we don't know that either because there's two different narrations of the same story, but one of the, says that one of the first things he did when he entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he saw that there were people changing money. You know how we change money? You know, you go and you change this for that because there was different types of money. You're talking about the, the creative, cradle of civilization. There was different monies passing through. So there were money changers who had tables set up in the synagogue, in the masjid. They had tables set up to change money. What did Jesus do? He went in there and flipped the tables and kicked out all of the money changes and said, this is the, word, the house of God. This is not the place for that. Kick them out. We know in Islam the same way. You don't do business in here. <laughs> you do it outside. So he flipped them out. And he came to tell the Pharisees what he came to do was to teach the people and the Pharisees that God's religion and God's law was not for the subjugation of people and, and, and nations. It was for the betterment of the human society. It was the better for the betterment of human civilization. And no one, no one had a monopoly on it. No one had a monopoly on it. So he came and became a threat to the ruling elite of his time. This was his biggest crime. He also came to revive the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses had become very strict because of their rebelliousness. But Jesus came to tell them that, look, I, not only am I the prophet, not only am I your Messiah that has been promised to you since the time of Adam, but I have also come to less, lessen the restrictions on you from the law. We know this from the Quran. He says, I came to make that halal for you, which was before haram for you. He came to fix some of their... Because we think that the Sharia is strict. You have not seen strict until you see Hasidic Jewish law. You have not seen strict. <laughs> it's too strict. Um, that's because of the rebelliousness. So Jesus came to, to, to bring order back to the law of Moses and the religion of Islam. His biggest crime was what he was doing to the Pharisees. He was threatening their power. He was threatening their status. He was disrupting social order as it was in the day. And let me tell you something. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your message is. I don't care how crazy of a crackpot and a despot you may be. The moment you threaten the elite, the moment you threaten the social status of the day and the social order and the ruling class and how they are doing business, the moment you become a threat to that, and the moment your message becomes a threat to that, and the moment your way of life becomes a threat to that, you will become public enemy number one, and you will be targeted for this reason alone, if nothing else. <coughs> Let me tell you that. Just search through history. And this is, should be a lesson for the Muslims, that this is the threat that we pose to the world today and the ruling elite is that not because we are crazy it's not because we are backwards it's not because we are all these crazy things they want to call us that's just a cover-up that's just icing they try to put on the cake to the fact that they know that Islam is an end to their reign they know that Islam is an end to their social status of using the means that they have to subjugate the people and to keep them ignorant and to keep them poor and to keep them in poverty and to steal away their resources this is the threat that Islam is facing the world on right now. And if that's the threat, then walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. May Allah make us successful in our endeavors. But this was the threat that Jesus Christ was to the Bani Israel. And this is why he became public enemy number one. This is why he became, he became the terrorist of his day. He became the number one terrorist to the, to the Bani Israel and the ruling elite of that day. And he was marked. He became a marked man. As you know, the mock man, they, they, they issued a fatwa on him for his death. They had to get him by any means necessary. But they had to figure out a way to do it. You can't just kill this man off. You know, uh, and I'll tell you that they didn't want to just kill him. Killing him off would not have accomplished their goal. If they would have just killed him, no one would have done anything. Jesus had no tribe. He was from Nazareth or Bethlehem. Both of those, he, had no, he didn't have a father. He, according to his statements, he had no father, so he has no, what tribe? What tribe are you going to bring? You have no father, you have no tribe. And, and not only that, but they would not accomplish their goal. And their goal was not only to kill Jesus and get rid of him by any means necessary, but their goal was to discredit him. This is what they had to do, is discredit who he is saying he is. He's saying he's our Messiah. 
He's saying that he is the Messiah that we have been waiting on for so long, but yet he's not sitting in the, the, the throne of Solomon ruling the whole world. That's what they thought. This, you see, this is their problem, is they thought that their Messiah, they still think this, and this I debate with them on this a lot, they think that their Messiah should come and sit on the temple of Solomon and rule the world with an iron hand. When Jesus tried to explain to them that you have the interpretation wrong, I am not coming to give you a rule of this world. This world means nothing. This world is going to come and go. He said, the rule I've come to give you, the kingdom. My kingdom is the kingdom of the hereafter. This is what I'm trying to bring you to. To bring you to the kingdom of the hereafter, not of this world. But we know that this is the Jews had become so entranced by this world. That's all they could see that all, success is only here. And we know this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us this. He has told us this, that they love this world so much that if you were to give them a life of a thousand years, it wouldn't be enough. If you were to give them a life of a thousand years, it would not be enough. And they say they're attached to God. Allah says that if they tell them that if you are truthful, then what? Wish for death. Allah says, but they will never do it. And this is the Jews that Jesus was dealing with. They were so entrapped in this world that if Jesus was not going to give them the world, they were going to get rid of him. And this was nothing new. This was what they had done with many prophets in the past. Just gotten rid of them. So this was what they decided to do. We have to get rid of Jesus. We have to shut him up. We have to shut up his message. And we have to discredit him. And there was one way to do this. And the way to do this was crucifixion. To, if we can crucify him. Why? Actually, Paul the Apostle teaches this why. Because Paul was a Pharisee. He understood the law. So he knew that when he became... Paul the apostate, you know, I don't call him Paul the apostle, he left the right religion with the law of Moses and he could have just, he, he left that for apostasy. He taught in Galatians that Jesus Christ was cursed on behalf of the law to remove us from the curse of the law. For it is written, everything that hangeth on a tree is cursed. This taught me three things. Number one, Paul was crazy. Number two, Paul directly contradicts Jesus Christ in every single thing he says. Because Jesus taught that the law was salvation. Paul teaches that, the salva that law is cursed and that by following the law you would never reach salvation. That salvation isn't abandoning the law and just believing in faith. Directly contradicts the message of Jesus. And number three, he teaches us why they crucified Jesus. That why they tried to crucify Jesus. Why they wanted to crucify Jesus. Was Paul quoted from Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy says that if you crucify a criminal, do not let him hang on the tree overnight. Bring him down that same day and bury them for they are cursed. And people who are crucified according to the law of Moses, they are cursed criminals. That means that they are cursed in this life, and in the next life, there is nothing for them. You are done. You're, there is an X on your soul forever. So they realized that Jesus is now coming to say he is a fulfillment of the law of Moses. He's saying that he's coming to fulfill the law of Moses. If we can crucify him as a criminal to that very law, he looks like the biggest idiot and liar and hypocrite on the face of the earth. So if we can find him a crime, if we can crucify him and call, get him found guilty of a crime that is worthy of crucifixion and crucify him, they're done. This is the arrogance of the Jews. We, 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 we can kill the Messiah of God. So they tried to crucify Jesus. And when Jesus came to find out, and the way they decided to get him crucified was by taking statements that he had said, twisting them to say that he's calling himself God. He's calling himself the king of the Jews. And at one time, People at, and the Christians will say, how do you know they were doing that? I said, let me prove to you one time how they did that. There's one thing that is left in the New Testament that shows one point where they tried to trick him. They tried to trick him. When they came to him and asked him, should we pay Caesar taxes? They came to that and asked Jesus, should we pay Caesar's taxes? Because they knew if he was to say no, he's a criminal. Right then, he's, he, he becomes a, a, a um, what is the word they use? Treason. That's treason. To say, you know, he's preaching now that you should rebel against Caesar. They knew that if we can do that, we'll get him killed right away. What did Jesus say? He tricked them too. He said, give Caesar what's Caesar's and give God what's God's. They left angry. So they had to find other ways and they eventually convinced Pontius to, 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 to want to crucify him. And when Jesus found out about this, when he realized they were going to crucify him, 
Was he happy? I thought if he's going to come live on the earth, that his whole point was to be crucified. He should be happy, right? This is not the Jesus you find. Jesus in the Bible runs. He leaves where he's at when he hears about this and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane which is on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And he tells his disciples, stay at the gate. He tells the Huarin, stay at the gate and watch. Why? So that nobody comes and gets me, I have something I need to do. Jesus had something he needed to do. So what did he do? He walked down the road, he fell on his face. And the Bible describes it that he prayed so fervently that his sweat became as drops of blood. <clears throat> Let me tell you that this is scientifically possible for you to bleed out of your sweat glands, but it has to be under the most extreme, extreme distress. It can happen. So whatever Jesus was asking for at this time was very, very serious. And what was he asking for? Was he asking for the strength to be able to do the mission that he was sent for? He asked... God, let this cup pass from me. Do not let them crucify me. Do not let me be crucified. Because Jesus understood what they were trying to do. And he knew that if he was crucified, that's it. His message is over. What he's done is rubbish. He, he will not be believed in <clears throat> if they can crucify him. But, but, as a submissive slave, he says, but whatever you will, that's what I'll do. Meaning that I don't want to be crucified, but God, if it's your will for me to be crucified, Qadrullahi wa It's the will of Allah and He does whatever He wills. And we know that any time a Prophet makes dua like this, from our aqidah as a Muslim, any time a Prophet makes this type of dua, it is answered. It is answered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ignore His Prophets. And we also know from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that every prophet, and this is the beauty of our deen, and, and this is why we love our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa so much. We love him so much. Because he said every prophet had a dua that Allah would answer. Every prophet was given one free pass that you can ask dua from me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. <clears throat> and he said that every prophet made their dua in their lifetime, except for me. So we, this, this could have been Jesus' ticket. He could have been saying, look, I got this free dua. I need it right now. If I ever needed it, boy, do I need it now. And we know that Allah did answer that and saved him from crucifixion. Even in the Bible, it can be proven. But our Rasul Sallallahu said, every prophet used their dua in their lifetime except for me. I saved mine to the day of judgment for you. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He saved it for us. His dua that Allah promised would answer, he knew we would need it. So he saved it to the Day of Judgment and that will be the dua that he will say when he goes and prostrates before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, My Ummah, my Ummah, forgive them. This is why we love our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa so much. But, so I realized Jesus could not be crucified. There's problems all throughout this crucifixion. And now I have major problems and I want to get to the end. So I went to and started asking a lot of people a lot of questions and I finally asked my textual, the textual critic professor at Bob Jones University about this. And you know what he told me? He told me, Joshua, the Bible is a book written by the hands of men and women, passed down through thousands of years, copied by the hands of men and women thousands and hundreds of thousands of times. And they made mistakes in their copying. And some people came and added mistakes. And some people came and added more mistakes. Some people, some scribes would read, a, read something and the grammar wasn't right, so they would just fix it. Some scribes would copy a book, and the theology of the book would not be fitting with what they are being taught, so they would just change the book to make it fit. And then the originals got lost, so then, then no one, there was no way to check the original. So people then just started making up things and saying it was this and that and this and that. And he said, and the scholars have tried their best to come to the original conclusion of what the author may have wrote, but they have only done their best. So what you have in your hands is a book written by men and women who left their fingerprints on it. And it is not perfect. So this is why I told him, I said, you know what? I said, this is not God's book. He's like, why? Oh, no, he told me, but the people who believe in it, this book, they believe in it by faith. Here we go again. <laughs> and that, that is that faith which leads them to salvation. I said, that's number one, that's foolishness. It's what you just told me. It's craziness. Number two, this cannot be God's book. And I'll tell you why. I said, God is perfect. Everything about him is perfect. Therefore, his religion should be perfect. His prophets should be perfect. 
His book should be perfect. Everything about his way of life and his method of operation should be perfect. His prophets in this book are not perfect. This book is not perfect. So either, it, either I have a problem understanding God or this is not God's book. So I left Christianity altogether. And I started to look for the religion of God because I knew God existed. No fool in his right mind was ever going to convince me that God didn't exist. I was a student of astronomy and I've loved astronomy all my life. It's one of the most fascinating subjects I've ever dealt with. And you're not going to tell me by looking at all of this, this around me that it happened by chance. I'm not that much of a fool. I was raised with a little more sense. So I started studying, studying other religions. I studied Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Wiccan, which is uh, magic and all that good stuff. I studied, I was a martial artist all my life. I had two black belts and was working on my third. So I studied Bushido, which is the samurai code of conduct, and I read the Hagakure and all, all of that. But there was one condition I had if I was going to accept another religion. Number one, it had to be perfect. And number two, there had to be something they could take and tangibly place in my hands to show me the validity of your religion. And you know why? Because my grandfather used to always tell me, and I remember this at this point in my life, whenever I would tell him, you know how we tell our parents, that's, I swear that's the truth, that's the truth, I'm telling the truth. I would, come on, we know our kids tell us this all the time, we know this, told our, we told this to our parents. My grandfather would always re rebuttal to me, he would say, well you know what young man, the truth always comes with proof. So if you're telling me the truth, where's your proof? He told me the truth always comes with proof. So if somebody tells you they're saying the truth, you ask them for proof. And if they can't give it to you, it's rubbish. So this was what I wanted. I, wanted, I didn't want you to just tell me your religion. I wanted you to prove it to me. Prove it, prove it, prove it. So I read the, the Torah again from the, from the Jews who said that even the one in the Bible was a little messed up. So I read theirs, still messed up. I read the Talmud, messed up. Um, I read the, some of the Vedas, some. For those of you from the Southeast Asian continent know that in 30 years I could not have read all the Vedas, uh, but I did read the Bhagavad Gita and some other ones. Messed up. Hinduism, you don't really need to read all the Vedas to see the foolishness in it. You can just study their, their basic belief system that, that, you know, that, that Krishna stole uh, you know, uh, uh, Shiva's uh, husband or they slept with his sister and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff, man. They're warring with each other and one of them killed the other one. And, Oh, it sounds like a soap opera rather than a religion to me. Um, I read the teachings of Tao. I read the teachings of Buddha, which I don't know why Buddhism is a religion because Buddha never mentions God. He never even alludes to the fact that God, and he even, his allusions even doubt that there is a God. I read the, the teachings of Confucius. I read the Wiccan Book of Spells. I read the Hagakurai, the Samurai Code of Conduct. Pretty good for some of the things other than if you're dishonored, you, you know, you stick your sword in the ground and jump on it. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are messed up in there. And what I saw was much of the same things. Some things that were logical, some things that were rational. And this is one thing that the textual critic professor told me that I could not believe. He told me that the reason people believe in the Bible is because they have faith beyond the reason to understand. They have faith beyond the reason of understanding. And that I told him, I said, so you mean you want me to take my same logic, rationality that God gave me as a gift to understand him and turn it off in order to understand his religion? This is craziness. He gave me my intellect for a reason. God's way should agree with reason and intellect. And this is what I found in other religions, this was not the case. And I read a book about Islam. And the book about Islam said that Muslims, M-O-S-L-E-M, that's a derogatory word in the Arabic language, he said that, it said that Muslims worship a moon god called Allah, who lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia, and that Muslims had many wives whom they beat uh, all the time, and that the greatest duty of a Muslim was to kill a non-Muslim at any time, at any place without discretion, and that by doing so they would get virgins when they went to heaven. So needless to say, I put the book about Islam back on the shelf, you know, and I, I went like this to try to mark Islam off my list, you know, I didn't want anybody to see that I even had the word Islam on my paper. And I said that if I accepted a religion, it, it would definitely not be Islam, and if I ever see a Muslim, I will hit him. And I'll probably call the FBI. I said, but I don't live anywhere that there's ever Muslims. I had never seen a Muslim in my life except when I had traveled to New York with my father. And I was living in South Carolina, so there's no Muslims here. I might not ever go back to New York if this is how Muslims are. Um, so I, I, at this point, I wrote religion off in my life. I wrote God off. And I decided that if God wasn't going to show me the right way, I was going to show him how I can do my own thing. So I began to live a life according to my desires. And I'm a perfectionist at heart. 
This is just my modus operandi. I'm a perfectionist. This drives my family crazy. I don't do anything without I'm going to try to excel at it. And, I'm, and I always let people know that I'm not going to do anything without trying to beat you at it and trying to be better than you at it. This is just my nature. Uh, if I was a Christian, I was going to be the best one. I was going to try to do the best that I could. I was going to try to outrun everybody. If I was going to be a Buddhist, I would have been orange robe, uh, orange uh, thing and sandals. If I was going to be a Jew, it would have been curls and I would have probably moved to Israel and you know, all this other craziness. If I was going to be a Wiccan, I would have been putting spells on everyone I knew. You know, um, so when I went after the dunya, when I went after the streets, I became a proper, you know, street credentialed thug. You know, I wanted to be the proper street gangster, and I was—I had a lot of catching up to do. And so I was ready to knock over as many people as I could to get to the top. And I was doing it, trying to do it as rapidly as I could. I was drinking, partying, the whole thing. And since uh, I had an anger issue, uh, I was angry at everything. And at that point, I thought I was Bruce Lee reincarnated. So anyone that that gave me the opportunity to prove that, I was going to do that. Uh, so I was getting in a lot of fights. They got me into a lot of trouble. One of them got a, me arrested because I beat up a young man at a payphone because he would not get off of it quick enough. So I promptly made him get off of it. And just so happens he was the son of a judge um, who heard criminal cases, who made sure he heard my case. And the worst part about it is I didn't even get to use the phone because I smashed it over the young man's head and broke it. So I was going down the wrong road. Two things changed that because I want to get to the end. The first thing that changed that was I got into a car accident that I should not have lived from. Uh, me and my friend were partying at Clemson University. Oh yeah, remember the scholarship I told you about? Lost it. Um, lost it because of the fight. But I was partying at Clemson one day and on the way back, me and my friend got into a car accident where we destroyed the car. We flipped it over and over and over and the car broke in two pieces. And when the state trooper came, he, he saw the wreck and he said that I've been to a lot of wrecks and people don't live through wrecks like this and you boys are standing here looking at me un unharmed. My friend had a broken ankle, I had to cut my arm. He said, and he told me, that I tell this the same to people who have things like this happen in their life, that this does not happen without God's hand playing a role in it. You are still alive for a reason. God has continued your life for a purpose and you need to figure out what it is. I laughed and I, in my head I'm thinking, you know, the man's out of his mind. You know, God, if he had a purpose for me, he had the chance to show it to me, and he didn't. So I looked at my friend. I was like, you know, he must be talking about you. You know, God must have a purpose for you. Maybe he saved me just to keep you alive, so appreciate it. Um, later on, a couple months later, uh, a couple weeks later, I went to New York City um, to, to visit my father, but I, I decided not to visit my father. I decided just to go party. Uh, me and my friend decided to go up there and party. We, we lied to my, our parents and told them where we were going, and we went to New York. And I got robbed at gunpoint at an ATM machine. A, a man put a gun in my face, and uh, he had the intention of robbing me, but he was not going to take the chance that I got away. So he put the gun in my face and pulled the trigger and tried to blow my head off uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Tried to blow my face off. I may, I'll never forget on Fulton Avenue. Uh, tried to take my head off at an ATM machine. And the gun didn't go off. And we ended up in a struggle, and I got away. Um, I ended up knocking him down and ended up running away. And when I told my grandmother about this incident, because I started to have nightmares, bad nightmares about these incidents, and I started waking up screaming and sweating and all that good stuff, my grandmother told me that God has a purpose for your life. I'm like, here we go again. She said, God has a purpose for your life, and He's really has tried to show it to you. And if you do not see it, you're the most ignorant person I've ever met, and I did not raise an ignorant person. And if your grandfather were alive, which he had passed away in 93, he would beat you probably till up and down the street and back, which he would have. I wouldn't have been getting away with all that stuff anyway. She said, so you need to figure out what God's purpose is. I said, I've already tried. I didn't find God. She said, God didn't go anywhere. You just haven't looked in the right place yet. She didn't tell me to go to church or anything. SubhanAllah. Um, so I became a deist who believes in God without a religion. And at that point in my life, I was 18 years old, I began to get on my hands and knees and ask God that if you want me to know the truth, you need to guide me. Because this is how prophets prayed, on hands and knees. So I got out of my hands and knees and said, God, if you want me to know the truth, here I am. This is probably your last chance. Take it or leave it. Eventually I met a Muslim, and this Muslim I had known throughout high school, but I never knew he was a Muslim. Number one, because he was an African American, thought all Muslims were Arabs. Number two, I did not know he was a Muslim because I did not know that Muslims along with their worship their moon god and beating their wives and killing non-Muslims, I didn't know that they could sell drugs, which was what this guy did for a living. <laughs> so I was at his house one day, 
and me and my friend were debating about religion and he said to me have you ever heard about Islam I'm like yeah <laughs> I heard all about that one he was like well I'm a Muslim I was like come on man quit joking with me you know like I'm talking about real Islam you're talking about like nation of Islam and five percent you know what I mean that's not what I'm talking about he's like no 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 I'm a real Muslim I was like, you can't be a real Muslim, man, you're black. He's like, you think I don't know that? <laughs> and I told him, I said, but all Muslims are Arabs. He was like, no, they're not. He's actually, he said, actually the smallest the minority of Muslims are Arabs. And I told him the other things I knew about Islam. He was like, man, what in the H E double L have you been reading? This is, this is probably written by someone who hates Islam. He said, actually, Islam is probably the complete opposite of everything you read. So I asked him, what is Islam about? He told me, I cannot tell you because I'm not the best Muslim. I don't even really practice my religion the way I'm supposed to. He said, but I can show you somewhere to go. You can come with me and I can take you to where they know about it. And I was like, okay, where? He said, meet me on Friday at the mosque for Juma. I was like, okay, I understood, meet me Friday. Then you lost me with mosque and Juma. He said, the mosque is just like a church. And Juma is just like church service with no chairs. I said, okay, chairs were the worst part about church, the pews. I said, where is it? You know, I thought we were going to have to drive like 200 miles, you know? Never seen a mosque. He's like, it's on Whitham the Boulevard. I'm like, man, not, now I know you're playing with me. I, I live off Whitham the Boulevard. There's no mosques in Whitham the Boulevard. He said, you know where Lee Road intersects with him? I said, yes, I live on Lee Road. Now I really know you're playing games with me. You just need to stop, man, you know, with the foolishness. He said, you know that missionary training facility on the corner? I said, yep. I used to take classes there to become a missionary. No mosques. He's like, you know that little brick building with the gold thing on top? I'm like, yep, the gym. He said, nope, that's the mosque. <laughs> I was, because they're in the same parking lot. I was like, oh my God. I wasn't surprised, like, oh my God. I was surprised, like, oh my God, these crazy Muslims live at the end of my street, man. You know, they live across the street from me. Crazy Arab Muslims. So I went home and I told my grandmother, did you know those crazy Arab Muslims live down the street from us? She was like, yeah, I know that. I was like, why didn't you warn me? I used to go there late at night, man. They could have, they could have already gotten me. I was like, those people are fine. Leave them alone. They don't bother anybody. And actually, the funniest thing was that their mosque burnt down a few years ago. And there was a box outside, you know, to rebuild it. And when I was going into the missionary facility, I, since I thought that was part of the church, I was putting money in the box to build the mosque. Anyway, it's a whole other ball of wax right there. Um, so I told her I was going on Friday to there for, for Juma. She was like, okay, just be really careful. And I was like, oh, now they're dangerous. Now I'm going there now, right? So I went on Friday and sat outside the church. I'm not just running up in the mosque. You know, I'm not no fool. I'm watching who's going in this mosque. And who goes in the mosque on Friday? Arabs, 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 maybe some Pakistanis, but at that time you all looked the same to me. A um, few Africans, but no American stepped foot in the building. So I'm like, check one, all Muslims are Arab, except a few Africans. Um, off the list. And now it's 1.20 and Musa's not here. The guy Musa, that's what we called him. He's not here, so I'm paging him. Cell phones weren't really rampant at that time, so I'm paging him and he's not answering me. Come to find out later he got logged up that same day. That's why he's not there. So the Imam pulls up in front of me and he gets out and he asks if he can help me. I told him, yeah, Musa invited me to Juma. And he, I didn't know he was the Imam, I just know some Egyptian guy, or some Arab guy. I couldn't find out he was the Egyptian man named Muhammad who was the Imam. He said, oh yeah, we know Musa, he just doesn't come that much. But you come in, we'll take care of you. So he brought me in, put me in the back. They put me in the back and gave me a chair. So I'm sitting here in this chair looking at all these Arabs in front of me. There's a curtain behind me and there's women behind the curtain chattering. And I'm like, why do they have to be behind that curtain? I didn't even see them go in because they, the entrance is around the back. I said, I bet you it's because they have too many bruises from all the beatings. Nobody can be seen. They can't be seen. So they're behind the curtain. And I'm looking at all these Arabs and you know what starts to come into my mind? My, my, if any of you have kids, you know what I mean. My spider sense starts going off. Yeah, I have a four-year-old, so I know Spider-Man. When Spider-Man's around danger, he starts tingling. He starts to have a little tingle sensation. Well, I started to get this tingling sensation that I've been set up. And I started to think to myself, you know what, I've probably been set up. Because you've been set up before and it felt kind of like this. I said, I bet you this guy Musa is working with these dudes here. Or he's been in the same situation, and because Musa was not the most trustworthy of characters, believe me. Or he's been in the same situation and got himself out of it by saying that he would bring all the non-Muslims he can to the mosque and trick them to come into the mosque for Juma, so they could do their little jihad and get their, get their virgins in heaven. You know, I'm like, they're going to drag me off out of here and kill me for sure. You know, because this was not, this is South Carolina, this is the woods, man. You know what I mean, KKK still running around at this time. People dragged in the woods and get killed all the time. So I say to myself, you've been set up. 
you're going to get killed today. You know what I mean? They're probably going to try to do you in. And then the Imam comes and he gets on the minbar, and I'm, I'm five minutes away. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this Imam seemed very soft spoken. I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's going to command everyone to kill me. You know, I, don't, I didn't see that coming out of his mouth. So he gets up on the minbar, and what does he do? Well, at the pulpit, that's what I knew it as a pulpit at that time. And he gets up, Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu I'm like, oh my god, he's talking about me now. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna get they're gonna get me for sure. This man is screaming in Arabic, he's pounding on this thing, he's pointing in my direction. I'm like, yep, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> and you know, he's screaming, I'm freaking out, figuring out how many old Arab guys I can knock out on my way out the door. <laughs> or should I take my chance with the women? But I know, and I'm, I, you know, I know from growing up that you don't want to take your chance with a group of women, and that might be where they keep the the weapons behind the curtain. Or can I go through the window? You know, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of here. But then the imam stops screaming at me in Arabic, and he starts to translate what he said: that all praise belongs to God alone, who is the creator of all that exists. We praise him, we seek his help, we seek his forgiveness. You know how it goes in English. And I was like, wow, this is some of the most beautiful rhetoric I've ever heard. And the khutbah that day was about the forgiveness of God. That the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is open to anyone, at any time, at any place, without discretion. And he said there's only three ways. I will not forget this khutbah, inshallah, unless Allah removes it from my memory. He said there's three ways that you cannot be forgiven. He said, number one, that your soul has reached your throat. Meaning that death has come to you. After that, no forgiveness. He said, number two, if the sun has risen from the west. I had no idea what this man was talking about at that point. He said, number three, the only way you cannot be forgiven is if you knowingly worship something else other than the Creator. Other than that, anything you can do, you can think of, God is able to forgive. And it was based on a story of Jibreel alayhi salam and al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When, when Jibreel told Muhammad, peace be upon him, that to tell the Muslims if they commit this certain sin, like they steal, Allah will forgive them. So he would tell the Muslims and then the Muslims would ask him about another sin. And he would have to go back to Jibreel. Jibreel would go back, come back and say, okay, Allah will forgive that one too. And this took place until finally, until finally, Jibreel salam, came back from and said, tell the Muslims that Allah says this. Tell them that no matter what they have done, no matter how great the amount of sins they have are, that as long as they do not willingly associate a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will forgive all of it. This was his khutbah. And I was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. I have never heard it laid out like this, but this is what I believe, that God created me. He's going to make me die. He's going to resurrect me. He's going to question me. Shouldn't he be the one to forgive me? Why do I need Jesus and, and, and why do I need Buddha and why do I need Krishna and why do I need all these other things? So. After the, the khutbah, they lined up for salah. And I asked them, you know, I looked, I was like, what are they doing, man? You know, they're blocking the whole way for me to get out. You know what I mean? They're going wall to wall. And somebody came and said, we're going to pray. I was like, okay. I want to see this type of prayer they're about to do. So they, I heard the Quran. Didn't mean anything to me because I didn't understand it. Beautiful, sound like a recitation. What caught my attention was when they bowed. And when they prostrated on the floor, verses and verses of many books that I had read rang in my head of this is how the prophets in the Bible prayed, this is how prophets prayed in many books of religion. I said, that, and, and I knew one thing else also, that, they, that this was not prayer. Salah is not prayer, it's a bad translation of the word. I said, what they're doing is not praying, they're worshipping. This is worship, this is ibadah. This is worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's salah, is worship. This is our ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I knew that it was worship. So I said to myself, you've written these people off, off of just reading one book. And here these people are talking better than you've heard any religion speak. And they're worshiping God in a way that you've never seen before. So I went to the Imam after the Salah. And you know our da'wah. You know the, the beliefs of Islam are six. And the pillars of Islam are five. And I said, you know what? Not to be disrespectful, there's nothing you're going to tell me that's going to make me believe in your religion. I've probably heard it all. I was arrogant. I said, but there's nothing you can tell me that's going to make me believe. I said, I have one clue for you, one question for you. Do you have proof? Do you have proof that your religion is true? Do you have something you can place right here in my hands to tell me that your religion is what you say it is? And he got a big smile on his face. <laughs> he said, come with me. Come. So I went into his office, and he went on the shelf and pulled off a book and put it in my hands. You know what that book said on the front? The Holy Quran. He said, this is our proof. 
and he explained to me what the Quran was about, that it was revealed to Muhammad, so and so. I said, okay, if your book is what you say it is, it will say it for itself. So I took it home and started reading it. The first chapter looked like the Lord's Prayer to me from the Bible when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. What caught my attention more than anything and made me want to read the book so badly was the second verse of the second chapter. Where this book is telling me, and I had the noble with all the parentheses, that this is the book wherein is no doubt, no discrepancies, no contradictions, no errors. And it is a guidance for those who fear God. I was like, oh really? Oh really? This is a challenge. I said, are you serious? This book is challenging me at the beginning in saying it has no discrepancies, no errors, no contradictions, and it's a guidance. I said, I found discrepancies in every book. I'll find it in this book. So my initial reading of the Quran was to challenge it, was to find the contradictions, was to prove that verse wrong. So I started to read all of the Quran and I noticed names that I had known all my life. I noticed Abraham, Moses, Noah, David, Jesus, Lot, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Mary, Jesus, all of these names I knew. But there was a difference between these people and this book. They were prophets. They were messengers. They were guidance for humanity. They were the best of people. They were at the highest echelon of morality in, the, in, in, in this book. And I looked at them, these people and I said, these are prophets. And all the questions I had about Jesus were answered in about three chapters of the Quran. And I could not put down the Quran in three days. I finished it in English in three days. On Sunday night, I closed the Quran crying by myself in my room. <laughs> the only thing I could say to myself was, this is the book that has no doubt in it and it is a guidance for those who fear God and I said I want to be a Muslim whatever's in this book I want to be so I went to the Imam and I told him I want to be a Muslim he said you sure? I'm like yeah he said you believe that there's no God worthy worship except one God I said yes I've always believed that I've just never been given it like this and this book is what you say it is he said but you also have to understand who is Muhammad and he started to try to explain to me Muhammad and I said I have one question for you that will explain Muhammad. Did he give us this book? He said, yes. I said, then he's a prophet. This is his validity. This is his proof of Muhammad and who he was. This is the greatest proof that it can exist for him. Because I know God is perfect. I know this book is perfect. Therefore, the in-between, the medium of the book, who is Muhammad, is perfect. That's all I need to know. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So I accepted Islam on this day in December of 1998 and I've been a Muslim ever since and the reason I do what I do and I'm going to close in two minutes because I'm going to have to, this brother probably going to kill everybody between here and Fulham to get me there on time. But the reason I do what I do and I tell my story is because I do not want any single human being on the face of the planet to have to go through what I went through to come to the truth that you have been born with. And this is the sad thing that it, that, that a lot of us have been born with this beautiful light and there's so many people right here in, in uh, uh, Lewisham, Kent uh, that don't know what you know and they want to know and they need to know and it's for their betterment uh, but we keep it contained in our masajid we keep it contained in our home and we keep it contained in our hearts and this is one of the greatest uh, um, this is one of the greatest oppressions that we have done to humanity is deny them the truth. Uh, I don't want anyone else to have to suffer like I suffered. That's why I don't care if it costs me my life traveling the world for the rest of my life. As many people as I can reach that don't have to suffer anymore, that's what I'm going to do. Because I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Because I, I could have been lost. When, when Allah says in the Quran that you were verily on the brink of the pit of the fire and we saved you from it, I feel that. I feel that very sincerely and I don't want anyone else to suffer and I'm going to finish with this statement that this is us, this is us. Jesus uh, is purported to have said in the New Testament, I don't care who said it, it's so profound, that no one would bring a candle into their home and then place a bucket on top of it because then no one benefits from the light. But they would bring the candle into the home so everyone can be of a benefit to the light. You, brothers and sisters, have the most beautiful light that exists. It is the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Muslim and to the Muslim alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He is the light of the heavens and the earth. It is the most beautiful light. Let me take it from someone who's been on the outside looking in and who has caught a glimpse of that light. It is the most beautiful thing that exists on the face of the earth. And it will draw people to itself more than a street light draws moths to it at nighttime. The only thing we need to do is remove the bucket that we have on top. Live our Islam openly. Live our Islam on the outside, in the streets, in the markets, in your work, everywhere you go. Take Islam with you as Allah